Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Scream 2, released in 1997, less than a year after the original smashed all expectations with audiences and critics alike. Writer Kevin Williamson and director Wes Craven returned to make a Scream sequel that commented on horror sequels much like the original commented on the genre in general. With them came the entire surviving cast in a much bigger budget since the original proved to be such a hit. In this film, Sidney Prescott has moved on to the fictional Windsor College in Ohio and is having a hard time moving past the events of the original since Hollywood just had to go and make a movie about it. Scream 2 is similar to the original in terms of tone and quality, but based on the rules of a sequel that Randy gives us, it does have a slightly higher body count. How much higher? Let's find out and get to the kills. Scream 2 has a similar opening to the original, killing an established actress to kick off the movie. This time it's Jada Pinkett Smith playing Maureen Evans, a chick who is not excited about the new movie Stab. It's a dumbass white movie about some dumbass white girls <laughs> getting their white asses cut the fuck up. Her boyfriend Phil convinces her to see it anyway, so they settle in and watch scenes that are a carbon copy of the original film, only with Heather Graham as a fictionalized Casey Becker. Phil heads to the bathroom, only to find the urinals occupied by a couple of nice ghost faces, so he steps into a stall where he overhears some weird noises from the next toilet over. When he puts his ear closer for a better listen, Mean Ghostface stabs Phil through the partition, who bleeds out his mouth and slinks down to his death. If the stab wound didn't kill him, the infection from lying on the bathroom floor like that probably would've. Ghostface sits down next to Maureen, and after she cowers against his shoulder, she finds blood on his jacket. Then he unsheathes his knife once more and stabs her in the stomach. She stands up and tries to get away from the killer, but he follows her, repeatedly sticking her in the back and the side as the audience obliviously cheers around her. She stumbles up to the stage in front of the screen and lets out a howl. <laughs> before falling back and dying in front of everyone. It's sad that she got killed because people weren't paying attention, but I will say it'd be kinda dope to be in a theater with that many people going balls crazy over a horror movie. After our title card pops up with a slash, we're reintroduced to Sydney Prescott, who has now learned how to use caller ID to ward off people fucking with her. She and her roommate Haley find out about the movie theater murders on TV, and reporters swarm her because of the connection. At Sydney's same college is Randy Meeks, who has a debate in his film class with new character CeCe Cooper and Mickey Altieri. There, they argue about the merits of sequels, which is really just just an excuse for the characters to be self-aware and borderline meta. Stab 2? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. The entire horror genre was destroyed by sequels. The murders attract Deputy Dewey to town, who's limping around way outside his jurisdiction to check in on Sydney and make sure she's okay. The media circus also stirs up Gail Weathers, who blows into town with a new cameraman named Joel, since her last one got his throat slit. She gets some lavish praise by local reporter Debbie Salt, played by Lori Metcalf with just the perfect amount of crazy in her eye. Gail hits up Sydney and pulls a real frenemy move by confronting her with Cotton Weary, recently exonerated from the crime of murdering Sydney's mom Maureen. Cotton just wants to make amends, but Sydney ain't having it, so she backslaps Gail to the ground. Guess they're not going to be BFFs anytime soon. Also not in the mood to BFF Gal is Dewey, who's upset about the way she wrote about him in her book. Page 41. Deputy Dewey oozed with inexperience. Yeah, well, maybe quit making all those weird faces and you'd get more respect, Dewey. That night, there's a big old sorority house party where a very young Portia de Rossi and her sorority sister, Rebecca Gayhart, try to recruit Sydney to the hashtag Greek life. House sitting another sorority by herself is Cece, who gets a call from a familiar voice. Hello. As can be expected, the call turns into harassment. Do you wanna die tonight, Cece? And while Cece chats with another sorority sister, Ghostface slips in through the front door. He attacks Cece and chases her up multiple staircases where she throws plants and bicycles at him before he catches up to her and throws her through the glass door onto the patio. He stabs her a bunch of times in the back, then lifts her up and tosses her several stories down to the concrete ground, giving us our third kill of the movie. If only she had trained to slay Ghostfaces too. The party that Sydney's at is cut short when everyone hears about Cece's murders, so they all rush out and- Wait, what the fuck is that guy doing? What the fuck is that face? That is the best extra ever. When Sydney goes back inside to get her denim jacket, she gets a familiar phone call before Ghostface attacks her because, just like the original, this movie isn't afraid of putting Sydney in danger early on. She escapes him because she's Sydney F. and Prescott and reunites with her new boyfriend Derek, who goes back inside to find and fight Ghostface. Dewey arrives to find Derek alone and slashed in the arm. How you doing there, Sid? Feeling some trust issues? Yeah, so is Dewey, who's questioning why Derek went back into the house alone. Yeah, it's awfully convenient. Way to blame the victim, dude. Gal figures out the killer is doing a sort of copycat thing based on the names of the victims, and Sydney gets a couple of detectives to shadow her from now on. Everyone's starting to suspect each other, with Mickey naming Randy as a possible killer, so maybe Derek should just act normal and not start singing to Sid in front of the entire cafeteria in a super cringy rendition of I Think I Love You. Oh, no, you're gonna do that anyway? Alright, dude. Afterward, he gives his Greek letters to Sydney, which we're told is a big deal. See, you're not supposed to give your Greek letters to your girl. No shape, way, or form. 
the brothers are gonna kick his ass. Is that a thing? After watching a scene from Stab where Tori Spelling plays Sydney and Luke Wilson plays Billy Loomis, Randy explains to Dewey the rules of a sequel. Number one, the body count is always bigger. Number two, the death scenes are always much more elaborate. More blood, more gore. Dewey, for his part, continues to make ridiculous faces. In the school theater, Sydney rehearses the play Agamemnon, where she plays Cassandra. During a seizure-inducing chorus scene, she starts seeing Ghostface in the crowd, but she's not sure if it's real or if she's just freaking out, man. Derek shows up at the perfect time to seem suspicious, so Sydney tells him to go on and get. While hanging out on campus, Randy answers Gal's phone to find Ghostface on the other end. He, Gal, and Dewey try to figure out who's making the call. And whereas in the first scream, it was suspicious when Billy had a cell phone. I guess by 1997, they were much more common since everyone on campus seems to be rocking them. This prevents Gal and Dewey from tracking the killer down in time to save Randy from getting pulled into Gal's van by Ghostface, his screams and struggles being drowned out by a bunch of youths walking by blasting Cottonmouth Kings. <laughs> Suburban life! Gale and Dewey eventually find Randy's body in the van, streaked with blood. I was always devastated by the loss of my favorite character, but I also always thought that it looked like someone just squirted a bunch of ketchup all over him there. Little hot dog, Randy. In the library, Sydney gets some creepy proto-AOL messages from the killer, and then Cotton Weary shows up, bugging her about doing an interview with Diane Sawyer. It's Diane Sawyer. Hello! <laughs> he gets roused up enough for the detectives to slam him up against the wall and take him into the police station, where Cotton gets upset with the way he's being treated. Could I please remind everyone here that I'm an innocent man. Yeah, well, maybe start acting like it, dude. He's not the only one being affected by this. Seems like everyone's on edge, with Gal cussing out Debbie Salt and cameraman Joel quitting his job out of fear for his life. Dewey and Gal manage to bond, though, so they take Joel's tapes to the university auditorium to see if they can find any clues. Dewey finds a hot one. No, not that, pervert. Another tape with footage of the kills. They spot Ghostface in the projector booth, and during the ensuing chase, Dewey and Gal get separated. Gal watches through soundproof glass as Dewey gets stabbed in the back by Ghostface yet again, spitting up blood and sliding down the window in dramatic fashion. But he doesn't make it onto the kill count because, spoiler alert, this movie just repeated the same dead Dewey fake out as the original. Gal manages to lock Ghostface out of her room long enough for him to get bored and do his disappearing act. After Sydney and Haley leave with their detective detail, Derek gets ambushed by his frat douche brothers who are mad at him for giving his Greek letters to Sydney. They tie him up to the theater's set design and engage in some really weird hazing ritual because they're so cool and fratty. Hashtag Greek life. In their cop car, the detectives make a couple of shitty and borderline inappropriate jokes. We tell you, we'll have to kill you. Don't ask, don't tell. Before Ghostface pops up to heckle them with a throat slit for Officer Andrews. These guys were never given much personality to work with as characters, but at least they're able to beef up the body count. Officer Richards survives his initial bout with Ghostface and pops up to shoot him, but Ghostface turns him into a hood ornament and drives recklessly through the streets, eventually crashing into some pipes that impale the cop through his head. It's a surprisingly gory kill for this film, with Richards twitching as he dies, and I've gotta give the movie credit for having such a graphic death. Maybe Randy was right about the increased gore. Sydney and Haley tear through the police car mesh and crawl over the passed out Ghostface to get out of the car. Not sure why they didn't take the opportunity to just choke Ghostface to death or something right there, but they get out and start running to safety before Sydney determines to turn back and find out who it is. When she gets there, she finds the car empty, and Ghostface pops up behind Haley, stabbing her in the chest and dropping her like it's hot. You just don't want to be friends with Sydney Prescott in these movies. It's basically certain death. Sydney's alright though. She runs off and Ghostface gets tired, I guess. She makes her way back to the theater where she finds Derek strung up and passed out, tuckered out by all that hashtag Greek life stuff. Ghostface shows up and reveals that he's Mickey! You know, the character you haven't seen since literally that cafeteria scene 45 minutes earlier. So yeah, that's kinda lame. Mickey tries to indict Derek as his partner in crime, causing Sydney to hesitate cutting him down, and then Mickey makes Sid feel super bad by shooting Derek in the chest. It's kind of a bummer that most of the kills in these movies are just stabbings and shootings, but I can appreciate the psychological damage that Mickey did to Sydney right there. Mickey goes on the standard killer tell-all rant, saying how he wants to be caught so he can blame it on the movies and get famous from the trial. These days, it's all about the trial. Derek's body is struck from the stage, revealing that there's a second killer, and out walks Gale, who is not the second killer, guys. Don't be stupid. Instead, it's Debbie Salt, who Sydney immediately recognizes. This is Loomis? In other words, that lady is Billy's mother. Yep, her motive's a lot simpler than Mickey's. You killed my son. That's right, classic Pamela Voorhees-like revenge. She shows off her crazy a little more by shooting Mickey a couple of times, who, as he's falling down, shoots Gal in the gut, causing her to stage dive into a table. Debbie goes over her whole plan to frame Mickey as the sole murderer here before Sydney hits her with a beer bottle and gets away. She takes an axe to a bunch of ropes behind stage, essentially attacking Mrs. Loomis with college theater production design. There's a big ol' ruckus on stage with swinging lights and fake flickering flames before some cardboard bricks 
Briggs knock Mrs. Loomis down and bury her. She's not done yet, though, popping out to attack Sydney for another round and actually getting pretty close to stabbing her before Cotton Weary shows up and holds both of them at gunpoint. Debbie pleads with her crazy eyes and tries to turn Cotton against Sydney, but Sydney knows how to win over Cotton's heart. Bet you that Diane Sawyer interview's looking real good right about now. Consider it done. Can't be Diane Sawyer, Deb. Cotton shoots Mrs. Loomis, and this actually does kill her, if you couldn't tell by Lori Metcalf's exquisite dead body face right there. That's a decade of Roseanne acting paying off in a big way. Still, the survivors are a little concerned. I always come back. And rightfully so, since Mickey pops up like a whirling dervish before the ladies shoot the shit out of him, finally killing him for real and giving us our tenth and final kill of the movie. Sorry, Mickey. If you had played dead a little bit longer, you might have been able to just sneak out of there after they left. Just to be safe, Sydney puts one more bullet straight into Debbie's forehead. I'm glad you're safe here, Sid, but I am a little concerned about that kind of overkill. Once again, the movie ends with Dewey alive and wheeled out on a stretcher, this time Gale going with him instead of filing a report. Sydney directs a gaggle of reporters over to Cotton to give him the fame he so desperately desires, then walks off into the quad, content with a job well done in a pretty solid sequel. What do you say we get to the numbers? Ten people died in Scream 2, three more than in the original, so I guess that rule about higher body counts held true. Six of the victims were male and four of them female, giving us a bit more balanced gender distribution than in Scream 1. With a runtime of two hours flat, we got a kill on average every 12 minutes, which is also a bit more frequent than in the original. I'll give the golden chainsaw to Officer Richards. He didn't have much of a character, but his death was so much more graphic than anyone else's in the film. The little twitching almost makes you feel for the guy, and the various angles we see it from just drive home the fantastic practical effects. Doll machete for lamest kill goes to Derek. Pretty hard to get more unimaginative than a single slug to the chest. And there you have it. Released in 1997, Scream 2 is a surprisingly solid follow-up to the genre-changing original, with everyone in the cast and crew excited to make it, despite some frantic production issues. Next up, we'll be looking at Scream 3, which had even more production problems and was not so solid of a sequel. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey guys, thanks a lot for watching the Kill Count for Scream 2. Like always, I want to thank Bloody Disgusting for continuing to post my videos on their site. I also want to thank patrons Hulk0509 and Nathan Smith. If you want to be a patron and support me on this channel so that I can release more content for you more frequently, check out my Patreon at Dead Meat James. There's a button right over there that you can click. And I'll see you next week. Thanks a lot, guys.